A number of us uh, several years ago attended a, a conference at a church where the teaching was excellent and the worship music was, well, best described as loud. It was so loud, in fact, that the church that was hosting it supplied earplugs for those of us who attended. Uh, and I, I must admit that I, well, I was one of the people who took earplugs. The words that were sung honored God. I sang along, could barely even hear myself. But the accompaniment for me was a little over the top. But I realized as I looked around that there were not very many people in that room like me. Most of the conference attendees had no trouble with the volume at all. And I suppose that is likely because this was just part of their culture. This was something they enjoyed. Many of them probably would go to concerts where the volume, volume would be at that uh, ear-piercing decibel level, in my opinion. But here was a church that took an aspect of culture and baptized it. They knew what would attract people to Jesus, and they used it to attract people to Jesus. They would engage the same kind of worship on Sunday mornings in their services, and that church attracted people by the hundreds, registering an attendance across their three campuses of over 2,000 people, which for a Canadian church is massive. On the other hand, there are some churches that try to attract people by other means. Instead of making use of a cultural phenomenon that is relatively neutral, like music, and using it to draw people to Jesus, they water down or they twist the actual message of the gospel in an attempt to get bums in the seats. They do this to the point that it is often hard to distinguish between what is being said in church and what is being said anywhere else in the world. And those churches inevitably don't grow. Oh, they may have bums in the pews for a little while, but spiritually, they're dying. It's difficult in a time when society does not reflect the values of the gospel to reach people with the gospel. And sometimes what happens is that the church succumbs to Stockholm Syndrome or something like Stockholm Syndrome. This is a term that's used for when hostages uh, form a, a psychological bond and a loyalty to their captors. And in our context, that happens when the church gives in to culture, making it indistinguishable from the culture. This was a threat that loomed large over the early church. Churches really up into the 4th century were surrounded by a culture that did everything that contrasted what the gospel proclaimed. Does that sound familiar? It's becoming increasingly like that in Western society today. A lot of churches continue to resist this tidal wave of cultural change, but it's hard. It's really hard. One example of a church that faced this challenge was the third of the seven churches uh, to whom Jesus wrote letters in the first part of the book of Revelation. This is the church at Pergamum. So we're going to see what we can learn from their experience. This is Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Write this letter to the angel, that's the messenger, uh, of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Now, the image of the sharp two-edged sword comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, in which the author says this, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now, commonly we use that to refer to the scriptures, but I suppose it can refer to Jesus himself as well. As the sword cuts, so the word can cut, and Jesus can cut with judgment. Maybe not the best way to start a letter. The sword could also have one other meaning. It could have been an image for the Roman government's right to execute capital punishment. 
which in this case, in the context here, would suggest that what Jesus is saying is, make no mistake, Rome does not have the authority to give and take life. I, Jesus, have that authority. Verse 13, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. Lots of cities have nicknames, eh? What's Hogtown? Toronto. The Big Apple? The Windy City. How about this one? The Rose City. Windsor. And we know that because Diana was growing roses on Christmas Eve <laughs> one year. Or how about this one? The Queen City. Regina, Regina, Saskatchewan. But you know what? I don't think anybody would relish the idea of living somewhere that was called something like Satan's backyard, really. I mean, there are places, you've maybe been to some of them as I have, that are about that hot, <laughs> but... I mean, the Tourism Bureau of any city would quickly nix the notion of calling some place Satan's city. So why was Pergamum called the city where Satan had his throne? No, to be fair, I don't imagine the locals called it that. I think that's a term Jesus has used here in Revelation 2. But he referred to it that way because of its commitment to the cult of the emperor and the many false gods that were worshipped while they were there. Uh, Pergamum had gained special favor from Rome because the people of Pergamum had helped to, to defeat some of these other eastern Mediterranean kings and make Rome all the more powerful. And so they were very loyal to the emperor. In fact, they had reminders all over about this. And from anywhere in the city, if you looked up the hill, you could see at the top of a hill there was a citadel there for all to see. And part of that was a huge temple to the emperor. A daily reminder any time anybody looked. And despite the fact that Pergamum was where Satan had his throne, Jesus says the church has remained loyal, even in the face of persecution that ended with martyrdom. We don't know anything about this guy named Antipas. I mean, unless he, that's maybe the short form of Antipas. No, I, I don't think that was it. Um, all we know about him is that he was martyred there follower of Jesus, killed for his faith. Verse 14, but I have a few complaints against you. I mean, Jesus is going back to his standard form here. He said something nice. I know this about you, but, but I have a few complaints against you. It, do, it doesn't seem to matter, uh, you know, how much you've suffered. That doesn't validate everything we do. He says, you tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. Now, unless you're very familiar with the Old Testament, I, let me give you a bit of background here. Oh, and the police have come to visit. So, anyway, that's always a good sign. Uh, some background on Balaam and Balak. Balak was the king of Moab, Balaam was a prophet of the Lord, but Balaam was a greedy guy. And Balak basically tried to buy Balaam. He tried to pay him to curse the people of Israel. This is in Numbers chapter 22 in the Old Testament. But no matter how hard Balaam tried to do what Balak wanted him to do, the Lord would only let him bless the people of Israel because, after all, Israel was the blessed nation of all nations. Balaam tried to do what King Balak wanted, but even his donkey got in the way. And that's not a metaphor. This was actually his donkey. Um... It was only when the Lord enabled the donkey to talk that Balaam finally figured out what was going on. This, this image that you see here is of, because uh, 
that Balaam was going along trying to do what the king wanted him to do, and this angel of the Lord was standing in the way, and Balaam couldn't see the angel, but the donkey could. And so the donkey kept trying to run him off the road because he was afraid of the angel. And, and, you know, Balaam would beat this donkey. It's kind of a humorous story, except I don't think the donkey thought so because he got beat three times. But uh, the whole idea behind that was that Balaam becomes this metaphor for anybody who leads the people of God astray. So here Jesus refers to this false prophet or prophets uh, in the Pergamum community by the nickname Balaam, saying that he led the church astray, seeking to uh, teach the church to eat food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. Now, the word for sexual sin there could be literal sexual sin, or it could be prostituting themselves to other gods, each equally bad. Verse 15, in a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you, who follow the same teaching. Now, we saw the Nicolaitans appear earlier in chapter 2 with the letter to the Ephesians. And the Nicolaitans we don't know much about, but we do know that they were people who infiltrated the church and tried to lead the church astray. So anytime the Nicolaitans show up, you know, it's not very good news. Verse 16. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So Jesus is quite forthright here. He, the word repent is a sharp command, and he would come in judgment if they did not step back from these pagan practices. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, that is literally everyone who overcomes, being steadfast in the face of opposition, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. Manna is this uh, sort of flaky substance that would show up on the ground every day uh, during the Exodus to feed the people. It was a symbol of the faithfulness of God. And in remembrance of that, there was some manna that was put into the Ark of the Covenant, which was the, you know, the big symbol of the Jewish faith. Uh, and the idea was that they believed that at the end of time, the ark would be opened and this hidden manna would be a blessing to the people. Another way of looking at it is, uh, perhaps for John, who wrote this, is to refer to it in terms of eternal sustenance without labor, in contrast to the food sacrificed to idols. So there's hidden manna, and then he says, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. The white stone probably referred to one of two things. In those days, jurors uh, would vote using a stone. If they believed that the defendant was guilty, it would be a black stone. And if they believed that the defendant was innocent and be acquitted, it was a white stone. So this stone is a symbol that in the final judgment, God's faithful people will be acquitted. It could also refer to a ticket to a festival. Stones were commonly used the way we would use ticket stubs today. or Nowadays, I suppose they're all on our phones. So think of the, the stone possibly being like the barcode that you get from Eventbrite or something like that. Um, the white stone would be a ticket then to the heavenly banquet. The new name concept is a reference to a couple passages in Isaiah in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah 56.5 refers to a new name given to God's faithful in the heavenly kingdom. Isaiah 62 verse 2 says that the faithful will be given a new name from the Lord's own mouth. These would be symbols of the removal of shame. Something that would have been very meaningful to the people of Pergamum. Later in Revelation 22 verse 4, John says that in the new Jerusalem, God's faithful will have his name written on their foreheads. 
Pergamum was a famous city in Asia. In fact, it was famous through the whole empire. At that time, it had a population of probably between 120 and 200,000. And if Ephesus that we looked at a couple of weeks ago was Toronto, then Pergamum was Ottawa. Ephesus was the cosmopolitan city. Pergamum was the capital with the huge library, the seat of government. In fact, the word parchment, uh, the paper on which documents were written in those days, comes from the word Pergamum. But so too does the concept of marriage, because Pergamum literally means another or additional marriage. It's the word the, where we get uh, monogamy, bigamy, polygamy from. Pergamum was the marriage of cultures. So there was, there was something going on there where cultures were being brought together, where in Ephesus there was this attempt to try and separate. So one New Testament scholar has said this. He said, The fault of Pergamum is the opposite of the fault of Ephesus, and how narrow is the safe path between the sin of tolerance and the sin of intolerance. Pergamum was a place not where cultures collided, but where they mated. If one could sum up the biggest problem of the church at Pergamum, is that they were starting to look too much like the culture around them. Today that can happen in a couple of different ways. We can start to be too much like the culture around us by the theology and the ethics that we profess. And we can start to be too much like the culture by the way we conduct ourselves. In short, it's about belief and practice. Let me give you an example of each. When a church chooses to believe and practice principles that are the same as the world around it, in spite of what the Bible has to say about these principles, that's a church that's given in to culture. So, for example, a church that condones the murder of the unborn or the infirm has given in to culture. And when a church chooses to conduct itself too much like the culture, it has given in to the culture. Say it has a cult of personality around the pastor, something you never have to worry about around here. Uh, or, or a power structure that favors a few, or a church that permits sexual impropriety in its ranks, that's given into culture. If a church is hard to distinguish from the world, it is given into culture. And it's amazing how many churches are choosing to do this because they think it's going to bring about growth. The last time I checked... People who could get the same thing by watching TV or reading a magazine as they could in church were not hopping out of their jammies to come here on Sunday morning. They're going to stay home and watch or read whatever they want. No, the church is called to be faithful to God's revelation in the scriptures to avoid succumbing to the culture. The church is called in many ways to be counter-cultural. In short, and this is my little pithy phrase that you might want to remember today, God calls the church to advancement without assimilation. What do I mean by that? Well, perhaps you've heard of the phenomenon called syncretism. There's a word you can use in a crossword puzzle at lunchtime. Syncretism. This is the amalgamation of different religions, cultures, or schools of thought. So, for example, when one says basically all religions are the same, they're either completely thoughtless or they're being syncretistic. When a church tries to integrate Buddhist meditation into its worship gathering, that's syncretism. That's different, and we can't stress this enough, from borrowing from a culture. For example, one of the reasons we sing more contemporary songs with God-honoring lyrics is because this is what is more likely to engage the world. I should note that the church has always done this. A lot of people don't think so. But whether it's plain song chant or classical hymns accompanied by the organ or gospel songs on the piano or what have you, the church has always employed the musical styles of the culture to engage people with the Christian faith. They have not always done so hastily, but they have done it. I mean, if the most popular digital downloads for music today involved the hammered dulcimer, 
we would sing God-honoring songs accompanied by the hammered dulcimer. Perhaps that scares you because you don't know what a hammered dulcimer is. Frankly, I'm not all that sure myself, but I know somebody who plays one. Shout out to Beth if you're watching. But she's probably not watching because she's a pastor. She's probably preaching right now. Um, or or if, if people in, in this community were inclined to listen to Bollywood-style songs, we'd employ more of a Bollywood style to praise the Lord. And that's why musical styles can vary so much in churches regionally. When I visited India, we weren't singing holy, 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 or seek ye first. We were singing songs peculiar to the cultural style of South India with lyrics that glorified God, because that's what people listen to. The church in Pergamum, though, was pressured to tolerate both theologies and practices that looked like the world around them, but were inconsistent with the teaching handed down from the apostles. They were challenged, for example, to tolerate uh, eating food sacrificed to idols at pagan festivals. This doesn't sound like a big deal to us, but it certainly was to them. They were challenged to dine in the temples of idols. They were challenged to participate in what were called guild banquets. Guilds were, this is often where the church really ran into trouble because guilds were kind of like the unions of the day. And in order to really, in most cases, work, you had to belong to a guild. And to belong to the guild, you had to participate in its events. And if there were things happening at guild events that went against your faith and you couldn't be in the guild, then you couldn't work. And that was part of the way that Roman society persecuted the church. So Christians were stuck. Well, those things don't make a lot of sense today, but how does this affect us today? Well, a few simple examples. An employer might make you work ridiculous hours including Sundays, preventing you from participating in worship or even in a Life Connect group. Or maybe a group of friends might decide to celebrate someone's birthday by going to a strip club. Or maybe this, perhaps a retailer may give you a better deal if you pay cash, thereby evading taxes legally due. See what I mean? God calls the church to advancement without assimilation. And that sometimes means, quite often means, making choices that are not popular. If we just go along with whatever's asked of us, we tarnish our witness for the gospel, and that's what could happen in the church in Pergamum. Granted, we don't have a lot of literal idols that we're facing today in Western society, but what if we replace the word idol with something that garners your attention. So, materialism, the pursuit of more so that we can live the good life. Or what we pay attention to on TV or social media or in books or newspapers. Because let's face it, TV, radio, social, literature, news, a lot of these things... Uh, they, they play up to the culture, and in some cases, they even try to set the culture because that is what will bring them more advertising revenue. And make no mistake, they're not out to do anything that isn't going to make them more money. They affect the language we use, the images we receive, so much of what forms us comes from all aspects of media. And so I'm going to offer you this quotation which I have offered you before that I think would be a valuable thing to commit to memory, and that is this word from A.W. Tozer, who was a great preacher of the 20th century. He said, what goes into a mind comes out in a life. See, we think about this in terms of kids, right? But do we acknowledge it with ourselves? Our minds are like our stomachs. I, I understand this better than some. What we let in affects our shape. Just as too many Big Macs are going to affect your waistline, what you let into your mind is going to affect your mental and your spiritual life. 
I like the advice of the Apostle Paul that he gave to the church in Philippi when he said this, Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Here's a thought. Print that out and put it next to whatever device you surf social media on or next to your television or whatever you watch Netflix on. Let that be a a barometer, a filter, if you will, for how you engage what goes into your mind. What if we replaced even some of the garbage we consume in our minds with the Word of God. And I preach to myself here as much as to you. I don't watch a lot of TV when there isn't good curling on, but I do consume a fair bit of YouTube. And what if I replaced some of the, you know, pocket knife reviews uh, that I watch from time to time with excellent preaching on the Word of God instead? God calls the church to advancement without assimilation. When we value what the world values, instead of valuing the kingdom, we forfeit our role as witnesses for the kingdom. And the solution is to seek first, as Jesus says, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See, the world and the church are locked. They're locked in a battle to the death. And we are victorious. We overcome Risking persecution, even martyrdom. Still sounds far-fetched to our Western ears, but it could happen. Give you an example. In Finland right now, there is a former cabinet minister who is on trial because she tweeted a Bible verse. It happened to be a Bible verse that the government of Finland thought was hateful, but it was a Bible verse. And now she could potentially go to prison for putting something biblical on social media. In one sense, a Christian would be safer in an Islamic country than in a secular nation, because at least in an Islamic country, you know where the boundaries are. Secularism changes the boundaries on a whim with the tide of public opinion. And Satan works to weaken the church through the pressures of a non-Christian society. So, what can we do? God calls the church to advancement without assimilation, but what do we mean mean by advancement? Simply, it means to proclaim the gospel, to lead people to faith in Christ, to do the work of evangelism. And the Western church, by and large, has done a very poor job of that. Because until very recently, culture has protected the church and provided the church with a large number of cultural Christians who show up on Sunday and give money and sit on a committee. But that's not church growth. Church growth comes when people who were oriented toward the world become oriented to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are converted. The basic message of the gospel must be proclaimed day in, day out, that each one of us is a sinner, wholly unable to satisfy God, our creator, by even the most magnanimous of works, that Jesus, fully divine and fully human, came in the flesh to take on our sin and die on a cruel cross for our sins to redeem us. And that only by faith in him and by his atoning work can we be set free from the chains of death. And that Jesus' triumph over death in rising from the grave is the only way to ensure that eternal life is ours. This is good news. And the church is called to proclaim the good news in word and in deed when we're in the building, when we're online, when we're out of the building follower of Jesus. You are the church. I am the church. We are the church together. God calls us to advancement without assimilation. A lot of people would say that if we can't assimilate with the culture, we're not going to have any fun. 
I think that's a very limited understanding of what fun can be. Because some people think that God's people can only have fun by getting together for a potluck supper that involves casseroles, playing Uno or Dutch Blitz, and drinking Shirley Temples or ginger ale or something. Now, granted, for some folks, that's a lot of fun, and we rejoice with them. But the gospel doesn't limit your fun Don't miss this. The gospel doesn't limit your fun nearly as much as church culture can limit your fun. What the Bible says we can do and what the church culture says we can do sometimes vary. But they don't have to. Again, pay attention to that verse in Philippians 4 verse 8. Fix your your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That actually opens more doors than you think. We can be holy in the world without being holy of the world. We can be set apart. After all, when we come to faith, we're called to be sanctified, to be made holy, to be made into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, maybe. Maybe we can influence cultural change in ways that the church has not really done without government support since the early days. How can we, the church, individually and together, speak to culture without becoming indistinguishable from the culture? How can we advance without assimilating? Well, this is so simple it's hard, but take note. Put your own spiritual growth and that of your family first. Everything we do is a matter of priorities. If you're willing to prioritize spiritual growth for you and your family, that speaks to culture. Read your Bible every day. Spend time in prayer every day. Engage in spiritual disciplines every day. Go deeper in a Life Connect group. Make sure you worship in community. Do fellowship with other people. Be all in for Jesus. It's so easy to be tempted by culture when you're surrounded by it, but we can advance without assimilating. Be strong in the Lord. Stand firm in the values you hold from the Word of God. Be shaped in every way by those values, and that hidden manna will be yours. That white stone will be laid before you, and Jesus will give you His name in His eternal kingdom. God calls the church to advancement without assimilation. It will all be worth it. We won't be in Satan's backyard forever. Let's pray. Well, Father, we need your Holy Spirit to blow through this church and every church that seeks to be faithful to your gospel. Fill us afresh so that we can resist the whims of culture and receive that white stone and that new name that you promise to all who are victorious, who overcome in the face of constant pressure. Give to us and to our church leaders discernment as we seek to be faithful when surrounded by the stress of a world that would have us succumb to its challenges. Give us both passion and compassion, passion to share your love with people who don't know you, and compassion to love them in heartfelt and practical ways. And help us by your Spirit to live and love with a view to receiving that hidden manna you promise to all who are faithful. We ask this through Jesus our Lord. Amen. If there was anything about that message that caused you to want to have a conversation, or uh, if the steps I outlined to what it means to be a follower of Jesus were steps you want to take, then talk to me outside afterwards if you're here, or hit me up on the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I'll be glad to follow up with you.